Don't Hide the Scars, a weekly podcast focused on addiction and recovery. Created by the nonprofit Pain, parents and addicts in need, and founded by Flint Anderson. Flint Anderson, uh, founder of Parents and Addicts in Need. Of course, Jason Chance here with Flint as well. And uh, our guest, Greg Champion. How's it going, my brother? Hello. Uh, hi, Jason. Hi, Flint. Very nice to meet you. Flint, you're, you're, uh, you seem to be a happy, jo- happy, joyous, and free. <laughs> <laughs> For today, I am, Greg. For today, I am. <laughs> One day at a time, my friend. One day That's at a time. It. That's, That's right. it. That's right. I always like to, to it, when people get in that uh, sobriety debate of, you know, the longer time recovery, I go, who woke up first? <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I always say, I know a lot of guys with years who don't have any days. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, of course, you're doing amazing work with Startup Recovery, which, uh, again, a wonderful facility and, the, and just the longevity of the work that you do with people that come through the door. But uh, one of the commonalities, of course, you do a lot of working with parents, too, mm-hmm. much like Flint. Yep. What are some of the things that you do when people come to your facility and it's their their child that you're sitting down and talking with them? So the, the tough part is really um, three, threefold for me. One, we got to set boundaries. We, we, we got to set boundaries. And it's really tough for a parent to let go. Um, mm. and, and so we, we have um, a couple options for them. One is we do have a family program. And we have a, a, a black belt, Al-Anon, who is also mm. versed in the recovery playbook. And she goes off and she works with the parents simultaneously as we are working with um, the, the client and really understanding addiction, understanding the way the brain works, understanding um, trauma, traumas and dramas and pains, the, fi- the family dynamics. And really, we're trying to get them ready to speak the same language as the person who's actually with us at Startup Recovery. Yes. Um, the, other, the other element we try to do is... Um, allow them for a new voice, like Greg, this young man or this young woman's meeting me for the first time. And so I may be, I may be able to say to this young man, listen, I know you've never done trauma therapy. I did trauma therapy. It changed my world. Okay. And what the young man sees is, Hey, I don't know. I have any history with you, good or bad. You seem to be an upstanding citizen. I trust you. I'm going to try it. And meanwhile, the dad's like, how did you get him to do that? I've been trying to get him to do it for 10 years. <laughs> right? And, and here, here's what the young woman and young man hear. Go to your room. I'm taking your car away. Yep. You know, they hear all these old stories. And so that's why a fresh face like me can really connect. And then last but not least, I really believe that um, in the parenting side of things is when I get, and this, this is not, I get all sorts of clients here. I'll get a father here who's getting some time underneath him. And he begins to cry on my couch. And I say, why? He's like, my kids will never forgive me. I'm not, my kids will never forgive me. You know? And I say, listen, how many kids do you have? He's like, I got four kids. I go, here's what I need you to do. I need you to start dating your kids, mm-hmm. dating my kids. I'm like, what do you mean date your kids? I'm like, here's what kids and family dynamics. We're going to go to Hawaii together. We're going to go to Vail together. We're going to the beach party together. They, they travel in pods. And so the social system of the four kids, this is just an example, sure, we, sure. we travel around. And what each kid wants is they want dad to go hiking with the daughter, go snowboarding with the son, skateboarding mm-hmm. with the youngest, come to my play, dad. And when I tell this person, begin to date your kids, oh, my God, that is a huge breakthrough. I can because, imagine. I mean, really is a huge breakthrough. I've had fathers write me tearful text messages saying, this dating my kids is a is is a juggernaut of success. Absolutely. And and and, and so those are really when you talk about the, the the work that I do, it doesn't come out of a book. It comes out of what has worked for me. It's come out what what things I when I raised my hand and said I'm having frustrations around raising kids, and some some guy takes me out to lunch or a coffee after a meeting and says, "Let me tell you what I did." Mm-hmm. And I really believe, guys, that. You know, there's a great TED talk where the opposite of addiction is connection. Absolutely. You know, right. we know that. And the more we can stay humanly connected to our kids, to our husbands and our wives, our partners is really is really what we're doing here. Um, and, and when I show interest in going to soccer games for my one daughter 
and softball games for my other daughter. And I'm the dad that's cheering and crazy. They look and go, wow, he's vested, mm-hmm. you know? And I did not have that as a kid. And so I'll wrap this little part of it. Well, what I mean, guys, Flint and Jason, is that for all of us parents, our number one goal is to break the cycle that, that disturbed our peace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was a latchkey kid. I was raised by a single mom. She was too busy to be around. And guess what? Childhood drama, trauma, and drama showed up on my doorstep. Yep. And I can tell you today, and Jason, you know, I have the two most amazing daughters because mo- both my wife and I are present. Right, we engage right. them. We have adult conversations. Um, and I'll just end with this. Every year they give out awards at my girls' school and the, my girls are in third grade and sixth grade and they always win most joyful. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, look up the word, if you look up the word joy, it's an extension of happiness. Absolutely. And Jason, you notice about me, I have many mentors, but I have one business mentor and he's got boats and houses and he's got all the material things. And I say, yeah, what, what's the, what's the definition of success? He goes two words, happy children. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I get teared up every time I say it because that's what I have. Yeah. yeah. And it's all due to men like you in the rooms. It's due to my partners in business and it's really to the families that come and to start up recovery and they trust us. Mm-hmm. And yes, I'm a for-profit business guys, but there is nothing that gives me more warm, fuzzy feeling when the light goes on yep. and that person is willing to be willing. And That's I get it. I get an email or text from the family or loved one saying, boy, you've changed our lives. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing better. Is there Greg? Clint, nothing better. No, nothing. It's, it's, I, I absolutely love what you had to say. You know, a, a lot of people, look, I still believe that we are doing things in treatment that are archaic. And uh, I know there have been groups out there like Al-Anon and those places that are, that are wonderful organizations, but there hasn't been a lot of change in that. Okay. And so about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I started the parent meetings, Jason, that right. you know of. And I, I, I wanted it to be different. And so we crosstalk. We throw things out in the middle of the room. We, we want to see what sticks because we don't have, we, we literally don't have all the answers to addiction. Nobody does. It's still a mystery. And so it's so vitally important that, mm. that we reach these parents. And Greg, you said it. To understand addiction, understand the brain, understand the underlying effects of, of, of that addiction, why it started, whether it was trauma, whether it, and, and by the way, trauma doesn't always have to be something um, evil. Nope. It, it, like with myself, it was, it was uh, 17 surgeries in the first 20 years of my life. You know, that's, that's, that's a trauma effect there. That wasn't evil. Nobody was trying to be mean to me, you know, but, but getting parents to understand addiction has always been our biggest challenge here. I can imagine that I was actually going to ask you both if there was ever situations where you run into resistance when you try to bring up trauma and especially with the parents wanting to acknowledge it. Cause I know Greg, you and I similar boat, uh, sexual abuse in, in our youth. Yep. And what that that does and the parents' willingness to acknowledge it. I mean, I'm pretty fortunate. My parents got on board and went, oh, yeah, okay, we definitely see that. Mm-hmm. But is that something both of you run into? Well, Greg, Flint, I mean, go well, ahead. Well, Flint, well, Flint one, one thing I want to say is, is that you had my attention as soon as you said I had 17 surgeries, right? Like, yeah. like that, that's the beginning of your TED Talk, right? right. Because, <laughs> you know, like, right? Because there's going to be a young man out there. Hey, my mom moved us 17 times. Right. You know, um, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I went to detention 23 times. Like, they're, right. they're, you know, they're, they're, you're right. There's, there doesn't always have to be drama, trauma, rum, but it can be something that, that is put on our doorstep that do, we didn't ask for, but right. became a big chapter in our life. So I want to acknowledge you with that. And, and to Jason, to answer you, I think that, you know, what happens with some parents is their ego gets in the way. Yeah. And if I have a messed up kid or my kid isn't this, suddenly right. it's a reflection of me. 
And I got an old saying, you can't save your ass and your face at the same time. <laughs> you know? So, so, so we, we got to tear down, we got to tear down the picket fences, right? Yep. We got to, we, we, you know, some of these rugs and these families are very bumpy because they've been sweeping stuff underneath the rug for a long time. Right. 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 And we got to bring it. You're, you're, what I think you're doing Flint. I'd love to join one of your groups sometime is I think you're bringing everything out into the light. You bet. And when you bring things out to the light, guess what? They grow. You bet. You know, Greg, it's interesting. When, when I started this thing, I thought, okay, this is going to be something totally different. The community hasn't seen it. And we have, again, been extremely successful at it. Um, we will have anywhere from 20 to 50 people on any given Wednesday night that shows up. And people that have keep coming, even though their kids are doing well, some yep. of their kids aren't, but but this is designed to get the parents through this, to get them educated on addiction and all the things that they're going to face. And of course, uncover them as well. Sure. You know, we, we have to take, we have to pull the covers off of them. And yes, we've had people that have not come back because they didn't, they didn't want to face that. Um, but for the majority of the time, we, we get them all coming back. But it's but it's interesting, you know. The the, the we've seen over seven thousand families through this office in, in in the last ten years alone, and and out of all those families, we have I have to say we've we've made a, a major impact uh, on this on this community in getting people to understand addiction. It hasn't been easy, Greg. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, tr you know trying to change things is is sometimes almost impossible <laughs> to do. Um, but I love the fact that when you're set talking about dads and when, you know, dads are sending you text messages and emails and you, and you want to cry, yep. you know, when, when these dads are sending to, I mean, brother, there is not a better feeling in the world. Okay. When you have this big old mountain of a man, <laughs> right. Standing there and he's just got tears rolling down his eyes. You know, it's a, it's just a beautiful thing. New Perceptions North, the premier drug and alcohol treatment and recovery center in Central California. A full continuum of medically supervised top quality care with programs for detox, inpatient residential treatment with dual diagnosis, intensive outpatient treatment, sober living, support groups, and more. With 50 plus years of combined experience and sobriety, Flint Anderson and Thelma Gatlin Wilson provide adult men and women with the highest caliber of professional health care, treating each client with compassion and respect, in a safe, comfortable environment to begin the process of recovery to proudly create and sustain a life without addiction, call 559-978-1507 or visit newperceptionsnorth.com. So Flint, let me, let me run something by you because this has been a scenario too where, where I've had a father take me out to lunch. The, the, the son is with us. He goes to the bathroom. I look across the table and he starts crying. <laughs> and I'll be like, sir, what's wrong? He's like, I made a mistake. I said, what's the mistake? I, I should have had him been working. I should have had him mowing lawns, washing cars, have a, a newspaper route, work at a bagel shop. And, 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 and what happened with the whole story that I'm seeing as part of some of these kids that are addicted is their parents gave them too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what ends up happening, Jason, is they, they don't work during high school. Right. They don't work during college. And then here's your college degree. Now go work. Right. Mm -hmm. And just like a veal calf, they don't know how to work. Right. <laughs> you know, right. And so, right. Then, so then their friends who do know how to work are getting jobs. They're on Instagram, having nice lives. Right. And all of a sudden the compare and despair syndrome sets in. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And then the parent goes, I gave him the best schools. I gave him the best education. I gave, but you gave too much. Right. Yeah. And I, and, and this is what baffles me. Um, Flint, I don't know when that education needs to start, but it needs to start because it's it's an epidemic in, in the United States. Oh, it, it is, no doubt. Look, 93% of our clientele goes to the finest school district in Fresno. Yep. And I would venture to say that 90% of those kids never had a job. Never, never worked in high school. They have been given everything. And you are right, Greg. They do not know how to work. They do not know how to even 
I mean, they don't even know how to pay would how to pay for their own cell phone, right? They 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 don't have a clue. But here's what I tell a lot of parents because parents are still parents no matter who they are, where they come from. I said there was not a parenting manual. Right. Oh. I said, I say, so, so don't try not to beat yourself up too bad, but here's where I believe that a couple of mistakes were made, but mistakes happen to everybody, but now's the time to change it. Yeah. And if you don't change it, this chaos that you're living in with your child is just going to continue and going to continue. So, so you're, you're going to have to get, pull your heads out of your asses. Okay. <laughs> and you're going to have to start listening to what we have to say, because what we have to say can and does work. Yep. Yeah. I think apathy is become a little too prevalent for mm-hmm. sure. And I know what some of the, the parents that I've talked to or aunts, uncles, grandparents, doesn't matter is, you know, I go, Hey, one of the things that I've had to accept, and I've been lucky to have guidance from different people and, and insight is my oldest is 13. That means I'm only 13 years old as a parent mm-hmm. and I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to have to accept that. Okay. I made this mistake. You can make amends with your children. They're pretty, you know, yeah. Greg, you're, you're, you're a, a, a daughter father. And so, you know how that can be. Yeah. I only got one. But you can make amends with your children. Matter of fact, you then teach them a lesson in doing so. And it's sure. okay to say, I was wrong. You bet. But we need to take a different path with this. I agree. It's a good, good input. Uh, I, I never heard that, that I'm only 13 years as a parent. Mm-hmm. And you're right. There is, there is no playbook. There is no. And, and if you do pick a book up from the airport, it, it doesn't do it. It doesn't. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. no, Come on. It does. Like, but, like parenting for dummies. We're all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? I don't know that I want to do that like a dummy. But, hey, but, hey, but guys, we should write the book because guess what? People would buy it. And, yeah. Absolutely. They would. But, you know, I, I do want to say this. There is a difference. I, I remember I have two boys. I wish I had daughters. I just I just don't have them. But I remember with our two boys, we literally put them to work for a family member that owned an asphalt business. And my sons are five years apart, but when they were 12 years old, we stuck them in the Fresno heat, 105 in the middle of the day, slopping asphalt out on a road somewhere. And after that summer, it was like, oh God, okay, (laughs) education, here I come. I got to go down a different, but but they learned a work ethic with that. And even to this day, they're 42 and 36. And, and, but I have to say, both of them have an unbelievable work ethic today. Yeah. It matters. Flint, Flint, I, um, I have a question for both you guys. And I think that this gets brought up a lot, probably in your, in your meeting. Um, One of the frustrations I have when dealing with parents is sometimes the tough love, which Mm -hmm. means I'm telling a parent to cut the kid off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they immediately go into, uh, you know, future tripping. Well, he's Mm -hmm. going to be homeless, right? She's going to prostitute herself, right? You know, all this kind of stuff. And, and I, I, you know, I, I never have the perfect answer because I, I, I think to myself, well, I, I could never have my daughter prostitute herself, right? you know, but in addiction, we get that low. We do. Yep. We do. Give me some examples in the rooms that maybe some of the parents have been able to help other parents with that same problem. Sure. When, uh, when I have to reach that point with a parent, um, one of the things I explain to them is that Um, what mom and dad, whether you think so or not, you may not think that your kid is a street kid. You don't may not think that they're going to be able to survive out on the street. I say the only difference between, um, your, your child right now in the street is that they're sleeping in their own bed. Everything else they're doing in the course of the day and the night, they are on the streets. Where do you think they're getting their drugs from? Where do you think they're going to meet people? Whether it's the good part of town or the bad part of town, they, they know the street scene. And I also say, look, can something bad happen? Yes, it can. Right. But the addict understands, at least in my opinion, Greg, that's what I understood. Finally, after 23 years of beating the hell out of myself. Okay. (laughs) I finally understood the hard line. Look, we love you. We always teach love here. You, we, 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 we love you, but we're not living in your chaos anymore. Yep. We are not supporting your chaos. We will support you in your recovery, 
but we will not support you either financially or emotionally while you are out there running the streets and using. Yeah. That's, that's just part of what we touch on. That is great. I love it. I love it. You gave me a tool to use that, that, Hey, 90% 90% of the time, this person's on the streets. The only yeah. reason not is you've given them a place to sleep. That's yeah. it. It's perfect. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. Well, and I think an interesting tie into what we've been discussing, especially concerning work ethic, is if you're not going to have it in the pursuit of joy, building a life, we all as addicts here know we put a lot of work into getting our fix. Yes, you're going to have to put that work into your recovery. So no matter what, at some point, you're going to have to require uh, acquire a work ethic. You make the decision, especially for parents. You make the decision now. Do you want to get them working now? And there's there's no guarantee necessarily that someone will become an addict. But would you rather see your child thrive or do you want to be their friend for the first 18 years of their life? Right. And and, and Jason, you've been down here. So we we do. we really, we get young people, uh, middle-aged people. I even have a 75 year old here with us right now. And we get people in their first 90 days. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm trying to do is give them pistons in like a fictional engine. Here's right. your 12 step program. Here's your IOP. Here's your community. Here's going to the gym. Right. Here's getting a, a, your a home group, right? Here's coaching with Greg right. and slowly 30 days, 60 days. Oh, by the way, you're now going to yoga class, right? You're mm-hmm. um, now now you're doing family counseling. Oh, now you're going to get a part-time job. And what I'm hoping is that we get these pistons going here at Startup Recovery, right. that when we integrate them back into life, they take the tools we've given them, feel confident enough to go execute with them. We have some other guardrails that we that they take with us that you know take from us, but really. Um, it is giving them these pistons two or three at a week or a month at a time to then have a, like a playbook that they can take out in yes. the world. And that's how we find success. Yes. Um, and one of the other things we do really well, and this is a cool program, is we have sober mentors. Mm-hmm. And we attach a sober mentor to each person in our care. Right. And what the sober mentor does is someone the long-term sobriety, long-term success in the industry this person wants to be in. Right. So now I have this young man who wants to be in real estate and be sober. Well, I'm going to introduce you to Robert. Sure. Robert's got yeah. 25 years in real estate and 20 years sober. Right. And that way the young man can see the flight path. Right. And and you know, Flint, you and I are roughly around the same age. I, I would never have made it without mentors. Oh, abs- absolutely, Greg. Yeah. A- absolutely. Look, I, I have a rule now. Not everybody abides by my rules, <laughs> but, um, you know, because I, I actually own a treatment center as well right here, okay. right here locally. So but but I'm a firm believer when you're getting that mentor or that sponsor or the accountability partner, whatever you want to call them. Today, yep. I, I, I really believe that that sponsor has to have at least seven years of sobriety and at least 10 years older than the sponsee. Yep. If, if you get somebody that's got a year sobriety or two and you're both the same age, hell, you're going to be dancing on tables at the local bar within about three <laughs> weeks, you know. Um, uh, but I but I love the fact what you said about that whole 90 days and that and that and that sort of that program. Because, see, here's the other thing parents don't realize, Greg, they don't get that opioids in particular, they yep. wipe out our dopamine receptors. They wipe out our serotonin levels. Yep. They cut our maturity level in half. Although that's not a medically proven thing, we all know that it is and, and, and that it happens. And so that can take one to four years to come back. Yeah. The good Lord, the good Lord gave us amazing bodies and there are certain things that will come back and they will. Now, there's people out there that will say that my material level has still not returned. But that's a whole other story. Um, I'm getting there. Why you got to call me out? Um, but yeah, it is. So, so again, the longer we have them in 
and not necessarily in residence, okay, nope. but in that outpatient, in that yoga class, in this class, in that one, the greater the chance they have for success down the road. Yeah. It's just a fact. And that is one of my biggest complaints about the treatment industry as a whole, that we just, and insurance companies, and I, this is a whole nother podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other episode. Man. That's a whole other episode <laughs> right there. Because we're just, we're just not, they're just not getting the time that's needed in order for, yeah. for the brains to yeah. heal the proper way. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and so um, I have a, a client now that I'm dealing with who, who has been um, on Adderall for over two decades. Oh, jeez. Oh, wow. And, and I'm telling this young person, I'm like, listen, you've been here four months. It, 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 it's not out of your system. Right. And I, and I said, please give it a year of sobriety. Give right. us a year of sobriety. And I got the parents to come on board and go, we will support you any way you need, as long as you, you go after that year of sobriety. Right. And guess what? I know as well as you do that when this person looks back at that year and realizes that they were sober on Hanukkah, Christmas, their birthday, Memorial Day, right? They're going to go, well, if I did it that past year, I can still look ahead and do it another year. It's, it's really a good barometer. And, and, and something, maybe Jason wasn't around when we did this, but another thing we added on to startups 90 day program is we went and got an apartment building. No, you did tell me about that. And we now have sober apartments. Great, great idea. And and what we try to do is they're down, they're here with us for 90 days and then they go down to the apartments for a year. Yeah. And it's, it's a sober Melrose place, you know, right. it's, it's, right. it's still right. all the, all the human, all the human elements going on, but <laughs> guess what? we have breathalyzing, we have drug testing, right. there's a male case manager and a female case manager on site, right? They do barbecues, they go to meetings, they come up to the house for meetings. And we've really created this nice water flow of mm-hmm. from the houses down to the apartments and they're in our care. They're in under our umbrella for over 12 to 15 months. That is just beautiful. And it's beautiful because, it, again, time. Get this crap out of your body. It's going to yeah. take time. Yeah. And, and again, parents don't they don't they can't grasp that concept. You know, they 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 think whether it's 30 days or 60 days and oh, God, my kid's going to be fine again. I can't tell you how many parents they they, they all get on board immediately. Right. Yep. Because because their kid just overdosed and and lived or or you know they're they're just full neck deep in their addiction uh and they all get on board and they're gung-ho for that first 30 to 60 days and then as soon as they see that kid doing better then they then they back up so i am constant i'm a constant pain in the ass to these parents to tell them a if both mom and dad divorced separated married whatever if you're not on the same page with this thing This is going to blow up on you faster than you think, because we as addicts, we will go after we're we're the animal planet, right? We're we're the lion going after the (laughs) lamb and we're going to go after the weakest one at any given point. So mom and dad, your butts better be on the same page with this thing. And if it is, this has a chance to work. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, to... You gentlemen know better than I, but we're adjusting neural pathways here. And it is possible and it does happen, but people oftentimes, not just the chemical changes, but the way that we think, and especially think about ourselves, it's such a huge part of the process, Mm -hmm. especially those with whatever the trauma may have been. You know, um, as I've talked, Greg, you both, uh, you know, sexual abuse, taking a look at that, that, that I do not have to play that role for anyone anymore. You know, part of setting boundaries, uh, positive self-talk. There's so much that goes into this, that we are changing in, in our thinker upstairs. And I love that you point out, and I know it's a big part for you, Flint, is that growing a community that look, there is a different way of life. Yeah. See it. You can, you can cohabitate and, and enjoy and engage with people of a different mindset than what you were used to. And guess what? If you go, Hey, Hey Bob, uh, I kind of just, I don't want to talk right now. You're going to be in a different environment of why what's going on to, Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that Jeff. But hey, if you're ever ready, go ahead. I'm here for you. You know? And mm-hmm. it's a lot of that adjustment that, that the addict needs to be able to go through. That's more than 28 days. That's more yep. than 30 days. Yep. Like you said, that's yep. a year, 15 months, yep. uh, a lifetime, a lifetime, process. a lifetime. It really is a lifetime. Yep. And, and, uh, you know, I, my, my, um, 
obsession to drink and use left somewhere between year three and five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But my obsession to obsess has never left. Correct. That's a great, that's a great way to put it. And, and, and the way has shown up, um, guys, has, has shown up in food, gambling, people, um, resentment. I'll mm. hang on to a resentment for 18 months. And even though right. like an, an old timer like Flint will pull me aside, he goes, dude, go to page 552. <laughs> Do the resentment prayer. Right. I'll be like, oh, that won't work for me. That one, no, I just get caught up. And I just, yeah. and the other, I was telling somebody uh, like two months ago uh, in this meeting I go to, they do two minutes of silent meditation, right? Hmm. So everybody goes, okay, when the bell goes off, you just, in my meditation, I am having revenge plans on how I'm going to hurt this neighbor of mine. <laughs> so two minutes, that's when I know I'm spiritually out of balance, when I'm using meditation to right. plan revenge. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, Greg, I'm going to give you another one. Try, uh, uh, you know, you know, Tony Hoffman, Tony and yeah. I talk about this a lot, how we as addicts and alcoholics, we don't know how to sit with ourselves. Mm. And that that's a big deal. And so I've got I've got a little little uh, deal for you to try. Okay, okay, I will. Just on your own time, so, yep. somewhere down the line. All right, go during the day. I want you to do this during the day. I want you to take an hour, and I want you to walk into your room, your office. I don't care where it is. I want you to power off your phone, not just put it on silent, but power it off. I want you to shut the blinds. I want. You, I don't want anybody else home. I want the dogs outside and I want you in your chair awake, almost in the dark and sit there for an hour. If you can do it longer, do it longer. Just sit with yourself. You don't even have to meditate. Just sit with yourself. That Mm -hmm. will, look, we're never going to master it. Yeah. But but I'll tell you what, if we can learn to sit with ourselves, then we can learn to sit with anybody else. Hmm. And, and, and Flint, here, here's the difference between Greg, newly sober and Greg, long time sober. When you first described this to me, I'm like, I can't wait to get home and do this. Right. right. <laughs> the newly sober Greg are like, there's no fucking way I'm doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's that's, that's absolutely correct. And and, and Flint, you, you, you and I are aligned. I I have another version that turn your radio off in your car. Oh, absolutely. Drive around. I I'm stuck in traffic all the time. When you have your radio off, you have thoughts going on. Right. Sometimes, sometimes those thoughts turn into conversations with nobody in the car. If you know, right. What I mean. no, other people are looking at you going, whoa, yeah. look at yeah, this cat yeah, over yeah. here. Totally. You know? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, but I, I have found I get some great thoughts yeah. in terms of the radio off and just the hum of the engine and just going. Right. So Absolutely. Mini version of, of what you have. But, but I, like I said, the, the, the version of me, the reason people always ask, hey, how do you have 27 years of sobriety and recovery? I've remained willing to be willing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when you give me a tool like that, I really can't wait to get home, right. kick the family out, put the dogs outside, go to my right. favorite lazy boy and sit there and go, okay, Flint told me to do this. I'm going to try it. Right. Yeah. Right. It's that ability again, to be pliable mm-hmm. that you got to be willing to know you don't know everything and that's okay. Right. Because Greg, in what we do, I I've told this story a, a, a thousand times and I'm going to tell it a thousand and one now. Back in, I want to say, I started this in 2009. So this was about 2011. I was going, and I still am, but I was going a million miles an hour. I was getting phone calls from everybody under the sun. It was just me in this office by by myself. And I remember it was nine o'clock at AM when I got to the office. I walk in, turn on the lights, go to my office. I sit in there. At 9.15, I get up, I walk out, I do not turn off the lights, I do not turn off the computers, I don't even lock the front door. I get in my car, I drive home, I go to my little man cave there where I did power off my phone, shut the blinds, and I fell asleep till 6 (laughs) p.m., And when, and when I woke up, I called my best friend, who's the guy that got me to, to, to Betty Ford back in 2001. And the first thing out of his mouth was, he said, you can't save everybody. Hmm. And 
it was such a powerful statement because Greg, I, I, I can, I can, I've just met you, but I can tell man by just by who you are, that, that we were both given our lives to this thing. Yep. A- and, and, and as soon as I, I kind of realized that I could not saying that I'm not going to try. Okay. But we have to take care of ourselves. That's the point here. We have to take care of ourselves so we can continue to try to help others. Yeah. yeah, I I had a mentor down here. My first year being in the business, um, in the industry, um, I wanted to bat a thousand. I, I I just I, I'm a I'm a I'm that type of competitor. Yep. And um, I saw I was losing myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and this mentor pulled me aside and says, "Working in recovery is not your recovery." Right. Mm-hmm. And so I make it a point that I go to meetings where my clients don't go. My staff doesn't go. Yeah. Um, I make sure that I have self-care on the calendar and it doesn't come off for right. anything. Right. And, and I'm so glad that uh, I raised my hand and I said, Hey, you've been in the business nine years. This is my first year. He's like, just remember working in recovery is not your recovery. Love that. And to your point, um, Flint, you know, your friend did you justice. And, and I've had those naps where you, you fall asleep for an ungodly amount of time. And it's finally your body's going, Hey buddy, if you don't do this, you might be sleeping forever. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, Greg, you have so many great tools and some that, that I've utilized uh, through our friendship. Can you throw a couple out there? They're brilliant. One of them that I employed immediately after the first time we met and talked digital scrub yeah. done. So, um, Flint, what I do with my clients about the sixth or seventh week, I said, get your phone out (laughs) and, uh, we go through the phone and here's who we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for Tiffany Portland, Stephanie Manhattan beach. (laughs) We're, we're looking for guy with blue eyes on, Uh on the plane today. Right. Um, you know, we're looking for Joe on the corner. (laughs) Yeah. And, and we begin to get all those people out of the phone. I love that. Cause see, we tell people to do that, but, but, but that, this is the first time I've heard of, of anybody in treatment sitting down with somebody and actually oh, doing it. Oh, and, and we have a kick about it. Cause we start to laugh. You're like, Oh, and, and, then, and the stories come out. Oh, oh yeah. Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany Portland. Oh my God. You know, <laughs> I go, you got to get rid of it. You're like this. Yeah, and, right. And the way this came about, and this is a big, and Jason knows this, the big part of my success working with people is none of my stuff comes from books, except right. for the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. But all my lessons come from this. I, I literally got a text from, um, oh, I literally um, was told to go, hey, can you go pick up a newcomer named Mark? I said, yeah, give me his number. He sends me his number. I put my phone. A few days later, it's on, I'm on my way to call him. And all of a sudden, right underneath Mark is Marnie. Now, Marnie is a woman who broke up with me 15, 16 years ago. Broke my heart. Crushed me. She left me for an accountant. Okay? <laughs> and, and, and I hate all accounts. I was, was going to say, the only thing works is a dentist. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So she left me for an accountant. And so all of a sudden, I get that anxiety, Right? And I'm like, I'm married with kids. Why is this person affecting me? And yeah. all of a sudden I, I go, I got to get rid of her. Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden, who else is in here? I got to get rid of him. Yeah. Former business partner who screwed me over. Got to get, you know, and I had, I, had a, I had a Tiffany Vegas in there. She needed to go. Yeah. You know? And all of a sudden, here's the two things. All of a sudden, I got all, everybody in my phone are good people. Right. right? And then think about this. When we're carrying our phone around, right, we are carrying the karmic energy of those people. Yes. So everywhere we go. And so this is why we call it. We're so important with the digital scrub. Right. Now, when I did Jason's scrub, it took two and a half hours. While he was <laughs> 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 and, 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 and he had to go out to his car and get a second phone. <laughs> oh, that's so, close and, and to you know, true. I, a little, a little fib. Real quick. I, I do have a little uh, uh, around relapse. Um mm. As you know, we deal with relapse, all three of us have in our own story or someone mm-hmm. else's story. And I really consider relapse being the salt shaker. And the salt shaker tips over on the table, right? And it spills out some salt. The faster you pick it up, the more salt stays in. And mm-hmm. so when someone relapses, I said, look, let's get back on the horse after one day, two days. I don't want to see you on a run for two or three months. 
Okay. Right. And when that soul shaker gets tipped back up, the majority of what you learned either through your therapy, um, your, your groups or your sponsor or, or your, 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 your committed meetings, right. Is still in the soul shaker. Right. And you don't know how many people have come up to me and go, that salt shaker changed the way I look at relapse. Thank sure. you for that. That's yeah. great. God, I love that. Yeah, I think too many people, and as you both know, you know, actually, the since between the last time we hung out in person stuff, I did have that, but it was a day. It was a momentary thing. It was, you know, because I wasn't, and it's so important for people to understand, they, they go so back quickly. I mean, tell me what you gentlemen think into the shame part of it. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. could I do this? Yeah. How could I? It's like, you're an addict. That's what yeah. we do. Right. And if we're not protecting our guards or growing, but you got to see it as another growth point, right? Why did this happen? Examine that. I know for me, it was, it was boundaries. It was not doing a good enough job with the digital scrub, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, That's literally it. You know, but the, the, the other thing though, along with that, I, I think that there are too many people out there today that will actually use relapse as a part of recovery as an excuse. 100%. 100%. You know, yep. um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I I think what you just said, Greg, was beautiful. You, you, you can't use that as an excuse. You know, my, my, my wife says it beautifully. Uh, after, after all I've been through, I'm still married to the same woman. It will be 43 years in July. I mean, everybody calls her St. Kathy. <laughs> um, but, but she always tells me this. She said, if, if you read, first of all, if I ever do, uh, I'm the one that's out, not, not yeah, her, yeah. you know, For she, sure. she, she sure, goes, yeah. I'm not moving out. No, you're moving out. Um, but she said, you've been given every tool under the sun. She always says, I'm proud of you, you know, but you've been given every tool under the sun. If you relapse today, she said, that's your choice. Hmm. And there is, there is a piece to that, that I, I have to think about, mm -hmm. you know, because we get, we get, we get, we get to a certain point in our, in our recovery where, you know what, maybe that is my choice because now I've been without drugs or alcohol for, for 21 years. Really? What, what, what am I going to face now? That's going to cause me to relapse because of a situation that's happening outside of, you know, my, my, my control. Hell, I've already been to hell. You know, I've already, I've already been through everything the last 21 years. So maybe that is my choice. So Flint, you bring up a great pro, uh, uh, topic here. Um, you know, alcohol and drugs are not the problem. They're the solution. Right. And what I have found is that the three men that are on this show right now, we do not have a problem with drugs and alcohol today, right? Today, we do not. Your right. listeners, majority of your listeners probably don't have a problem with drugs and alcohol today. But what's going to happen is a problem is going to show up on their doorstep that is going to want to make them use or drink. And it's a problem that causes them to go out, not drugs and alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I found is that, and, I, and Jason knows this, is that, you know, I've gone through divorce, stayed sober. I've gone through my 10 month old daughter having open heart surgery, stayed mm -hmm. sober gone through my mom's seven year bout with Alzheimer's stayed sober. Mm -hmm. I've been fired. I've been bankrupt. I lost my sister to suicide. I've stayed sober mm -hmm. because I am an old AA guy. Yeah. And what, what they taught me way back when we don't drink or use no matter what. Right. Because when we do our problems get worse. And I will tell you, Flint, if you went out with 21 years, here's where you would go. Hey, what's this heroin? What are these fentanyl? What, what's, what's, what are these kids doing? And as soon as you go out there with, you know, me too, with our old man bodies trying to go fish for fentanyl or, or <laughs> we're done. We're done. We're done. It, done. Over. And, 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 and I say this about addiction and alcoholism. It's undefeated. Yeah. yeah. It's undefeated. Yeah. It's like getting in the ring with Tyson, Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. You are not going to win. Right. Yeah, well said. Well said. Well, speaking of fentanyl, Greg, yep. let's touch on it because it's, I mean, to steal from Flint, yes, we did just go through a pandemic, but this is the pandemic that people are not speaking yeah. about. Yeah. And what are you, 
I mean, really seeing w- with you folks there, because for us, it's just it's in droves. It's in droves. Yeah, it, it, it's the same. It, it's really twofold. It, it's these, um, you know, as they're saying, a- 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 accidental overdoses. Some some people, some parent groups are saying they're poisonings because yeah, the, yep. the kid didn't know. I'm, I'm up for anything that starts the conversation. <laughs> right. Right. Um, uh, we have lost people who left startup, decided that, you know, uh, I'm going to go celebrate, uh, call their, their, their dealer for Xanax or something else. And next thing you know, they're waking up on the couch or they're not waking up on the couch. They're dead. Right. And, and it's because of a small dose of, of fentanyl. I, I think it's twofold. One is the, the, the scumbag drug dealers who are actually putting it out there to kill us. Okay. Mm-hmm. That, that's part of the epidemic. The, the sick part is the people who are out there using it, knowing that they're putting another bullet in the gun because basically if you're using fentanyl, it's just a matter of time before you overshoot the mark. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's the one part, even with all my knowledge and credentials and life experience, I just don't get. You know, look, we did a podcast with a gentleman named Michael Johns. I don't know if you know him. Mm-hmm. He was a speechwriter for President Bush. This guy is uh, huge on all, mm-hmm. all kinds of policies for Russia and China and those places. And he brought up a topic the other day. And, you know, we all know that the fentanyl crisis started in China. And of course, now China, has, you know, they ship it into Mexico. Mexico, yeah. they, they manufactured it, it comes over our borders. We got so deep into that conversation that he believes and all his connections in Washington, D.C., they all believe that this has actually been designed by China. This is a war against us in the United States. This is uh, I, I can't remember the exact term that he used, but this this has been designed and planned for many, many years because they know of the opioid crisis that we're facing, number one, and this is just another way to get to us. And it's working. And it's, it's unbelievably sad that we can't change the laws to make this tougher on the criminals and the drug dealers I've, I've, I've been to Sacramento with assemblymen here, uh, to try to get five years added to just five years added to the jail sentences of drug dealers voted down by the, by the state of California assembly in five, less than five minutes. You know, that that's why that word poisoning is coming into play because now, now if somebody recognizes that it's a poisoning, you know, you're going to poison somebody. You can't prove intent uh, and charge somebody in manslaughter because you can't prove that they intentionally tried to kill their client. That's mm-hmm. the, that's the difference right, right now. So, it, you know, it, again, it's, it's, it's coming down to a lot of parents. They, they're going, Oh, this is so bad. This is so, I just can't believe it, but they're not, they're, they're, they're not buying into it a hundred percent. They still don't think it's going to happen to their kid. Yep. They still don't, even with everything. I've had people call me and go, well, I didn't even know this was an issue. I go, how can you, how do you not know it's an issue? It's, it's everywhere. That, that, that you just hit it right on the head. That that's the issue. They don't think it's going to happen to their kid. And it's going to be the one time that uh, their daughter is in the car in the wrong thing. The bag opens up and it's one of those things where they, they didn't mean even to use it. Right. But it's so powerful. It knocks everybody out in the car yeah. and the car yeah. goes off a cliff or into a tree or into an 18 wheeler. Yeah. It's funny. Um, you know, uh, I do think that politically probably China has seen that we are a very addicted con- country. Mm-hmm. We've been addicted since the sixties. Right. You know, and um, I'll give you a stat that blew me away when I got in this business. So um, the United States makes up 5% of the world's population. Yep. Okay. We I know where you're up, going. We make up 95% of all prescription sales. Yes. We Holy. use, we Holy. use, yes, we use 99% of the world's Vicodin supply. Yep. Wow. <laughs> I mean, th- th- these, these are staggering numbers, yep. staggering numbers. It, it's, we are 
the, the, the pill for every ill society, yep. you know, but what, but, but you had that, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is, that is, is an important statement. And I haven't brought that statement up in quite some time. Thank you for reminding me yeah. about that because that needs to be out there more. You know, when we're, when we're using, you know, that 95 to 99% of the world's Vicodin supply and the, and the 90, I think it's 93% of the yeah. world's opioid supply. What does that tell us? Yeah. I mean, we, we've checked out as a country, as a country. We have checked out. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I know both you guys know this because remember the young man I told you about that had been on Adderall for 20 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, he was put on it when he was 12 years old. Of course. Right. Of course. And, and so it's part of his DNA now. You know what? I did something one time, Greg. I, I, I had to go speak at this school at a, at a high school and it was in front of their what they call a SART group. So you had yeah. parents and you had teachers in there. Right. And and I can be kind of a smart ass from time to time. And, and, I, and I walked in and I and I looked at everybody in the room and I, my first statement was, OK, I'd like to know uh, how many people here have your medical degree. <laughs> and they're looking at me like, what kind of question is that? And I said, I, I'm going to repeat it. I said, how many of you have your medical degree? And they go, well, well, none of us. I said, why are you prescribing Adderall to five-year-olds? Yep. I said, why are, why are you going to their parents and saying this, this kid is so hyperactive that, that, that we believe that he needs to be on or, or on Ritalin rather at five. I said, I said, I said, what, what gives you, I know I was never asked to come back and speak back there again, <laughs> but, but I didn't care. Because I, I told them, I said, five-year-olds are supposed to be a pain in the ass. Okay. I said, that is their job. I said, not everybody is, is, has, has ADD. Yeah. That's where it's starting, Greg. You know it. And, I know and, it. Jason, you know it. And, and Flint, we, we, we know that um, sometimes parents, not all parents, but there's a group of parents who are just lazy. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they don't want to raise their kid. They don't want to take the kid to little league or put them in jujitsu. Right. Um, there's plenty of parents that say, Oh, I'm going to hire a nanny to raise my kids. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many of my clients have been raised by nannies yep. or, or gone, gone away to, um, uh, boarding those, school, uh, boarding schools. Yeah. If you are going to be a parent, parent, be one. <laughs> Be one. <laughs> right. Otherwise, what, what are we doing here? What are right. we doing here? People? It's easy. It's easy to make babies. It's hard oh, to raise them. <laughs> totally. Right. Well, I, you know, and I like the point that you brought up too, especially about with America and the, the quick fix pill. And it's one of the things that hangs with me that my sponsor said is the uh, stop looking for the outside solution to an inside problem. And we are so wonderfully marketed to that. If you look this way, if you have this car, if you have a, there you go. Life is set. And I'll tell you, I went after all that shit and I was more miserable, right. more miserable <laughs> than I could ever be, you know, <laughs> but now figure out and talk with that brain up there. And I'm starting to figure out solutions and working through problems yeah. sober. And that's it. At the end of the day, that's what we're wanting to achieve. That's right. Greg, you got any last wisdom you want to drop on us here to wrap up this episode of don't hide the scars. Yeah, I, um, I'll tell you a little story. I, uh, a few months back, um, my daughter was going to go on a camping trip and she says, Papa, can we go down to the store and get some, some stuff for s'mores? So she's in the front seat. We drive down the hill. We go to Vons. We collect uh, the marshmallows and the chocolate, right? And, um, and the graham crackers. And uh, we get back in the car and then she looks over and this is, God honest truth. She looks over and she goes, Papa, have you ever gone to jail? Whoa. <laughs> right? Nine years old. <laughs> wow. And, and this is a moment where all parents have a choice, whether to give them the soft story or give them the truth. Mm-hmm. And I paused for a second and I said, I think she can handle the truth. And I go, yeah, I've been to jail eight times. Eight times? <laughs> And I said, yeah, I said, each time I went to jail, it was Greg plus drugs and alcohol equal jail. Mm -hmm. And I said, I haven't been in jail in a very, very long time. Ooh, I get teared up Uh, because I took drugs and alcohol out of the equation. Yeah. We drive a little bit further. I have my hand over here. She grabs my hand and she goes, Papa, thank God you're sober. Wow. Beautiful. I love it. That says it all, my friend. Says it all. 
that sa- that that says it all. You know, yeah. just and just to touch on that, I I know that when I when I finally leave this earth, that my sons and my wife are going to know that that I died clean and sober. Yep, that's it. That's what's important. Hey, you both want to make me cry, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're talking about leaving and you beautiful family. And, uh, Greg, if people want to know more and, about and, and, and here, Here's my last point. Yeah. It's, it's okay to cry, men. It is. Yes. It's it okay is. to fucking cry. Real men do cry. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. Uh, what, you come back again. We'll have to talk about that because that's something yeah. that I've yeah. been doing a lot of of individual work in and encouraging men to like you know why we do a lot of stupid shit because yeah. we're, we're either told or we are unwilling to get in touch with yep. how we feel yep. and work on that and how it it alters our thinking especially of ourselves yeah yep. so anyways i love you both <laughs> uh, great for more on uh, startup recovery and uh and the playbook can you tell yeah, people how to so- find you Everybody, we're on we're on social media uh, at Startup Recovery. Uh, if you want to see our houses and our apartments, it's startuprecovery.com or startupapartments.com. And uh, if you want information on the recovery playbook, just put the recovery playbook in Google. And we have many different assets on that. And, and that's basically the coaching curriculum, Flint, is I'm sober, now what? Ooh. And it really addresses, hey, you got 90 days of sobriety. What life lessons do you need to be taught or retaught um, right. in order to move your sobriety forward. So I love it. Yeah. So, I, and, and, and Flint, let's figure out a way how I can get up there to be part of your parent group or have you start one down here because they sound like they're magical. I, w- I you know what? I would love to do that. I, you know what? When we get off of this thing, we'll, uh, I'll get the e- your email from Jason and we'll start staying in touch and we'll, we'll get something going on that. My friend, I, I, pr- I appreciate I that. You got it. Thank you so much. And Jason, keep being a program of attraction. Yes, sir. <laughs> Lesson learned from a champion. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> Take care, Greg. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, please call Parents and Addicts in Need at 559-579-1551 or check us out online at painnonprofit.org. Follow us on social media at Pain Nonprofit. Please subscribe to the podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. To donate, please click the link in the description and help us save more lives gripped by addiction.